right. Okay, can everyone still hear me and see my screen? Good. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Zico Coulter. I'm a faculty in uh, the computer science department, also affiliated with MLD. And I'm going to talk today about kind of one bit of work that we're working on my group, but it is just one, um, but it's but it's one of the ones I'm sort of most excited about these days, um, which is about equilibrium models in deep learning. Uh, this is work actually by two current MLD students, uh, Shaoji and Ezra on the bottom here, as well as it's also, uh, we're also collaborating some with a researcher at Intel, Flatland Colton. So the idea of this work kind of, I like to think about it as kind of questioning the, the, the nature of the deep part of deep learning. Um, because the story we all tell about deep learning is that um, these algorithms, the sort of this state of the art machine learning that we're all really excited about and really enthusiastic about, in some sense, it does some kind of you know, hierarchical processing of the data, like the first layers extract you know, edges, then there's parts, then there's whole states, et cetera. And I at least want to make the point that we can think about deep learning in a very different way. And it brings out a very different class of algorithms that I think we're just starting to understand and which have a lot of potential value and power. So in particular, I'm actually going to jump right into a few things in this talk. I'm first going to talk about how we can uh, and how some of our current research replaces deep networks with single layer networks. They're, they're more complicated layers. They're implicit layers, but they don't increase parameters at all, and they work just as well. How we can scale these systems to large scale sort of modern vision tasks like image classification and segmentation. And then also finally how we establish things like existence uniqueness of these, of these, uh, of these operations. So this is sort of very much ongoing work and there's sort of more work to do in each of these areas. So if you're interested, um, please do, please do come uh, send me an email. All right, so the first thing we're going to do to sort of set this up is I'm going to think about a different kind of network, which we're calling weight-tied input-injected networks. So most networks you think of in deep learning, sort of, you know, you have the, your input at X, and you sort of go through a bunch of layers to get your output Y. And each layer maybe is the form, like, you know, the next layer is some nonlinearity applied to the previous layer uh, plus, a, plus a bias, um, a linear function of the previous layer plus a bias term. I'm going to take a slightly different tact, um, and actually it's a different version of, of uh, of networks called input injected weight tied networks, where there's two key differences here. The first is that we're always applying some function of the input and adding it to each layer. That's sort of difference number one. That's not a big deal. I mean, you can imagine that's sort of a trivial dif uh, difference in some sense. And so the point two is that we're though, which seems like a big deal, but really isn't, is that we're applying the same weights to e at each layer. So it's always the same W matrix we apply at each layer of the network here. And this might seem like a big difference. I should clarify this. It might seem like we're sort of making a big assumption here, but it turns out actually we're not. Um, both theoretically and empirically, I won't talk about today, but from both theoretical and empirical perspective, this works just as well. There's no need to have different weights at different layers in your network. Um, but now what's something interesting happens, because now if you look at the form of this iteration down here of the weight tied input injection network, um, it looks very much like a dynamical system, right? It's like some, some repeated application. You're just, you're just repeatedly applying the same exact function to each layer to get the next layer. Um, and if you keep doing this, uh, what happens both in practice and in some cases in theory is that this process will converge to some fixed point. So there'll be some point Z star where if I apply this layer one more time, it won't change. This is what we call a fixed point or an equilibrium point of this process. And you can think of Z star as kind of the settling point of an infinite depth deep network. It turns out if you use this infinite depth, sort of, you know, infinite depth, but also sort of single depth uh, uh, point Z star, then um, it does as well as if you actually, of course, it's, it's the exact same thing as if you, of course, you know, unroll the full network. And so using that as your network, just finding this equilibrium point is very powerful. And the idea of our, of our approach, which we call deep equilibrium models, is that rather than um, sort of iterate this process in the sort of traditional way, we just directly try to find that equilibrium point using things like root solve, or like root finding equations. So this is obviously a nonlinear equation with the solve. And if we can just solve it exactly, we have computed the same thing that an infinite depth neural network would compute. And so um, this is that, that's sort of the high level. Um, I won't get into details of how we sort of train this thing. It's sort of nice also because, you know, because it only has one layer, we don't need to store all these other layers in memory, and so it's much more memory efficient and kind of things like this. Um, but the point I actually want to highlight is that maybe somewhat surprisingly, this works just as well as, as sort of deep net, as modern deep networks. 
So for example, a language modeling task where you, we, we, we build a version of the um, of various language modeling uh, architectures like transformers for this. And what we find is that sort of across the board, so I'm, sh I'm showing now sort of several different architectures here of different sizes, but if you look at sort of a classical architecture and it's uh, DEC variant, so it's deep equilibrium model variant, what you'll see is that the DEC typically performs a little bit better. So we have lower perplexity here, which is how you measure the quality of a language model, and it consumes much less memory. And this sort of holds pretty constantly around a lot of size architectures. Though I should emphasize that some of the biggest architectures that there are, um, we have not, you know, we, we can't quite scale up our, our training. We need, we need bigger computers to really train these things and, um, you know, TPUs and such, and we haven't scaled these things. But on everything where we have sort of comparable parameters, we actually do better than the existing model using much less memory because we only have one layer in our network. Um, so this is actually really exciting, I think, as a sort of a general direction to go. Uh, and I'm really, really excited about sort of the, the, the future of this direction. Um, but there are some problems here. So the first problem is that it's slower than traditional networks, uh, which is unfortunate because actually finding that equilibrium point ends up taking more time than the typical number of iterations you go through a network. So this is sort of not the greatest thing. Um, the second thing is that there are there do seem to be some sort of fundamental problems here for domains like vision um, because vision I mean language model is one thing it's kind of a flat hierarchy vision seems fundamentally hierarchical and there's a real benefit from having not just hierarchies of depth but also different scales of your image and the other thing is that you know it's really hard to say from a theoretical standpoint when these fixed points actually exist or are unique and things like this and so we want to have some better understanding of these properties and I want to highlight at least right now some ongoing work that tries to address these two problems. So this is again, this is sort of very new. It's actually under not not uh, it's an archive, but not uh, not published elsewhere yet. Um, the first of these are multi-scale deep equilibrium models. So this extends these DEC models to the case of, of multi-scale vision domains, where actually rather than just sort of finding a single equilibrium point, what we actually do is we maintain multiple different scales, uh, sort of resolutions of of, of features in tandem, apply kind of a residual block to each of these, um, but then importantly kind of mix them all together. So we upsample or downsample the different size images to mix all the resolutions together at each step. And we can kind of think of this whole thing together jointly as the function that we're trying to find an equilibrium for. In other words, we're trying to find kind of a joint equilibrium point at all scales of our features simultaneously. And then we of course, you know, take, uh, you know, we, we apply a solver to this, and then we um, can apply a loss function to the to to these different um, resolutions. And what's very nice here is that we can actually apply different loss functions depending on our task. So we can if we apply a loss function to the lowest resolution, kind of the most aggregated features, um, we can do things like classification. Whereas if we can take the same architecture, apply a loss to the high resolution, and then do things like um, predict uh, semantic segmentation and things like those, because it's a, it's actually a feature set over the entire domain. Um, and this works actually, again, sort of uh, impressively well. Um, it's, it's not, you know, we're, we're not quite competing with the very, very best in image net performance, certainly. But if you look at comparable architectures, we do pretty well. So if you look at sort of, you know, small architectures where they're say to, you know, 2 million, uh, 20 million parameters, you know, we're, we're, we're doing competitively with things like ResNet um, 50 and things like that. And same with, with larger models. So they, they, you know, like all models, they do better with more parameters, but for the same number of parameters, we're very competitive with the current state of the art, um, if not quite at the very, very best state of the art. Um, same is actually true for semantic segmentation. Um, we're better than, you know, a lot of standard uh, state of the art architectures, but um, uh, use, but importantly, I guess this is sort of the important point I want to make, is that these models, they, they aren't just toy models, these things that can sort of compute fixed points, they're actually competitive with state of the art, um, uh, classification and semantic segmentation, importantly using the exact same model for both. So there's no need to sort of create a different model for different different tasks and things like this. They use the same model for both. Um, and they generally kind of show that this notion of using what, what we call an implicit layer, because this layer is not defined explicitly, it's defined implicitly in terms of a condition it wants to satisfy. This is the first indication that these things really are competitive with the modern state of the art and they're, they're going well beyond the performance of, 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 previous, of previous implicit approaches to show that they are really um, on par with the current state of the art in deep learning. So the last thing I want to highlight too uh, before I have a couple more slides here is something about the theory of these, of these things. So 
um, it's, it's obvious, you know, an obvious question is, well, you're talking about an equilibrium point, but how do I know it's going to exist? How do I know it's going to be unique? These sorts of things. And for a long time, we didn't really know this. We sort of defined this heuristically, but we're getting, um, so in some other work that we're doing, uh, we're actually getting a really good handle on the theory of these operators as well. So in particular, um, there are actually conditions where you can say, so consider so a single layer deck like this. There are actually are some conditions like a positive definite condition and, and, and sort of a, a condition on the monotonicity of the, of the bundling that actually guarantees both uniqueness and existence of the fixed point. Um, and this actually uses a theory called monotone, it uses sort of a body of literature called monotone operator theory. And in fact, the way we show this is that we show that this particular operation is equivalent to what's called a monotone operator splitting problem, which is sort of a very well-established technique in analyzing optimization problems. So essentially what we're showing is that this fixed point here corresponds to something like the solution of an optimization problem. And therefore, if we have sort of, sort of like an, an analogy to convexity for these problems, we can actually can show existence and uniqueness of fixed points. Um, now these conditions are not actually obvious, just that they, they, they are satisfied. Um, the first one, the second one actually is okay because most um, prox most nonlinearities people actually use can be represented as proximal operators, but that's not always the case. The second one's a little bit harder. I don't want to get into details too much here. Um, you have to actually reparameterize your layers a little bit to make to make this actually work, which forms a new class of of decks that we call monotone uh, operator decks, which you know work work. Uh, they don't work quite as well in practice as, as, the, as the other ones I was talking about, but they do have these theoretical guarantees, which is very nice. So at a high level, um, what excites me about this work is that I think we can really start to rethink what deep learning is all about. There's been this assumption that depth and hierarchy is, in, is, is necessary for the power of models that we currently have. But actually, I don't think this is the case. What's actually the case is that the power that deep learning systems get is not from their hierarchy or different levels. It's from repeated applications of nonlinearities. Um, and, this and, and this perspective both you know, sets up an easier, I think, kind of more conceptually clean formulation based upon these fixed points. And it also leads, I think, to, to really new directions in how we approach models. So these multi-scale decks that can use the same model to do many different tasks, as well as a new theory of how these things actually um, should be analyzed and should work in practice. And so I think this is going to uh, potentially uh, really shift how we think about learning, how we think about the nature of, of deepness in learning. And I'm, I'm really uh, excited about continuing on in this direction. So if you're interested, um, I have a couple minutes for questions right now, but please do uh, send me an email as well. I guess I might not be on the list that, that Diane uh, sent out because I forgot to get her back on this, but, but, I, but I am taking PhD students and happy to talk with master students as well. I, I don't have any uh, specific slots for master students, but I'm actually uh, it's you know, always, always potential to work on, on problems, so I'm happy to chat about them.